Hey guys, welcome back to Chris Rank here. So today we're going to talk about the if statement in C++. And the big idea here is that the if statement can cause other statements to execute under certain conditions. So we'll start off by taking a look at this program here. And with this program, you've got what's known as a sequence structure. And it's called that because all of the statements in the program are going to execute one right after the other. So line nine is going to execute, then line 10, then line 11, then line 12, and so on. So all of the statements execute in a straight sequence. Now, oftentimes you need to have a program that can have its path of execution branch into a different direction. And so this can be done by using what's known as a decision structure. And so the simplest way that a decision structure executes is to have a particular action occur only if a certain condition exists. If that condition doesn't exist, then the action doesn't happen. So you can see in the flowchart on the screen right now that you've got a couple of different options. So if it's cold outside, then we say wear a coat. If it's not cold outside, then you skip that part. So you have this action that gets conditionally executed because it's only going to execute when a certain condition condition exists. Now with the sample flow chart on the screen now, you can see that it can get even more complex. So we can execute multiple actions based on a condition. It can be one or more. So if it's cold outside, wear a coat, wear a hat, wear gloves. If it's not cold outside, skip all of those actions. So one way that we can code a decision structure is by using the simple if statement. So the if statement has a format that looks like this. You've got if some condition exists, then execute the next statement. So we have something like that. That statement is conditionally executed because it's only going to execute if the condition exists. If it doesn't, then the statement is going to get skipped. So we'll go ahead and create a program that will demonstrate this. So we'll create a constant variable and we'll call that uh, voting age and we'll initialize that to 18. So then we'll ask the user, enter your age, and then we will read that in to a variable. Then we'll do our if statement. So if your age is greater than or equal to the voting age, then we will tell you, you are eligible to vote. And then after that, we'll say, you know, goodbye. So you're only gonna see that, that output you are eligible to vote if your age is actually over the voting age. So let's go ahead and test that. So you can see when I do 22, then we see that you are eligible to vote because this condition evaluates to true. And so since it's true, then the very next statement here executes. Now, what happens if I enter in a value that is less than the voting age? Well, now you don't see that, right? Because 16 is not greater than or equal to the voting age of 18. So this very next statement gets skipped and then we just saw the goodbye on the screen. So take a look at the logic on the screen in flowchart for me and you will see, you know, if your age is greater than or equal to the voting age, then we display, you know, you are old enough to vote. A couple other examples here. So let's say we had, you know, if age is greater than or equal to 21, then we might do something like setting a Boolean variable uh, can drink to true. Or we might do something like if number is less than zero, then we might see out and say invalid number. Uh, or another example might be something like if over time is equal to true, then pay rate is time and a half. Okay, so in this first example here, you know, we're testing age, and if your age is greater than or equal to 21, then we set this Boolean variable can drink to true. Uh, here, we're doing a test to see if the user entered a negative number, and if they did, then we display on the screen, you know, that's an invalid number. And then here, we're checking to see if overtime is true, if maybe the person's working overtime, and if so, then we increase their pay rate by one and a half. But if overtime is false, then nothing happens with their pay rate, doesn't change. Now, here's something to be very careful of, and that is where you put your semicolon. A lot of times I'll see this with students that make this common mistake where they just think, oh, well, there's a semicolon that goes after every single statement, so I better put a semicolon there. Now, this is a logic error. It's not a syntax error because it will compile. So let's see what happens if we leave that in there. See how it compiled and the program's running? It's kind of a insidious error in that way. So if I put in here 15, right, that should be false, you know, because 15 is not greater than or equal to the voting age, and so we shouldn't see you are eligible to vote, but we in fact do. Why? Because this statement executes 
and it's its own separate standalone statement. And so no matter what happens, the next statement is going to execute. They're not linked together anymore. All right, so a quick little note about programming style in the if statement, you know, the, the compiler ignores white space. So you could just as easily write this all in one line and it's going to work exactly the same. So if I do, you know, entering 22, you're going to see that you are eligible to vote. Um, now it's common practice to split these things up onto separate lines like this. So that way it's easier to see that this statement goes with this if. It's just a little bit easier uh, to read. You know, you need to be careful when you're comparing floating point numbers, because remember that computers, they estimate floating point numbers, and so they're subjected to rounding errors. So let's see an example of a potential problem that could crop up. So let us say that we create a couple of double variables. We'll do double A and double B, and we'll initialize A and B, so 3.14. Now, if we add just a little bit to A, so if we do some something like this, A plus equals um, zero point, lots of zeros and a one. And we check to see if they're equivalent. We could say if A is equal to B, say C out, they are the same. Okay, now we shouldn't see this, should we? Because we've changed the value. A is gonna be 3.14 with a bunch of zeros and one. So they're not gonna be the exact same, but you're gonna see that the program it reports that they are the same. Why is that? Because of rounding errors. So it's you have to be careful when dealing with this to avoid any types of rounding off errors with floating point numbers. It's a good idea to just stick with greater than and less than comparisons uh, for these types of numbers. A couple more quick things for you. Uh, something to keep in mind here is that an if statement will consider any non-zero value to be true. So what do I mean by that? So let's create a variable called value and we'll assign to it five. Now, if I put inside of here, just if value, what I'm saying is, is if five. So true is represented internally in C++ as one, right? False is represented as zero. But take it a step further, and true is also any non-zero number. So when we say if value here, value is going to evaluate to five. That means that the test expression is going to evaluate to true. So we'll say this is true. So if I compile and run this, you're going to see that it actually executes, right? Now, if I was to set value to zero, well, then this test expression is going to evaluate to zero, which is false. And so we're not going to see this is true. Okay. Now this does open up some interesting possibilities because you can place inside of here um, arithmetic expressions or expressions that evaluate to some number. So you can say if value plus one, for example. Well, when you do that, zero plus one is one. So that test expression is going to evaluate to true. And so then you're going to see, you know, this is true, you know, or you could do or use the pow function, for example. So if we pound include CMath, and we do in here, pow three squared, right? So that's going to evaluate to nine. And so pow is going to return nine. So it's going to be if nine and nine's not zero, therefore it's going to evaluate to true. Now, of course you could still do something like this where you could say if it equals uh, four, uh, well, it's not going to equal four because three squared is nine and nine does not equal four. So there's different ways that you can write your test expressions and keep in mind that any non-zero number is gonna be true. It's only zero that's gonna be false. Which leads to one last thing you have to be aware of, and that is that, and this is very important, another mistake that's really easy to make and students make all the time and I make all the time, is that equals is not the same as equals equals. You know, like in your math classes, you know, you might be used to writing something that looks like this. You might say, well, uh, A equals five. This isn't checking for equality. This is an assignment statement. So if I was to, create a variable uh, a and, and put in my test expression if a equals five. Okay, so what's what's gonna happen? Well, this is gonna evaluate the true. And why is it gonna evaluate the true? Because this is an assignment statement. So this executes first, so the five gets assigned to a. And so when if takes a look at a, it's gonna be five. And so if five is gonna be true. So you have to make sure to use the double equals. It's really easy to forget to do that. So now when we use the double equals, you know, we see the behavior that we were expecting.
So now you know the simple use of the if statement, a basic decision structure in C++, and some potential pitfalls in how to avoid them. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.